Hello, everyone. Welcome to another LIP seminar. So today we had the have the pleasure to have Margaret Neil Leitner, uh, who's a full professor at Karlsruhe Institute. So she started her career working on Higgs particles in the standard model and supersymmetric theory at DESI. After her PhD at the University of Hamburg, Margaret did several postdocs in Europe, including a fellow at her. So Margaret made notable contributions to Higgs production via gluon infusion, including next to leading order and QC corrections, composite Higgs models production at the LHC. And since 2019, Margaret has been the convener of the Higgs pair production subgroup and of the next minimal supersymmetric standard model subgroup since 2015. Today, we ask Margaret to present us an overview of what we've learned about big sector since the discovery with the experimental status and the implications of the theory side. So once again, thank you very much, Margaret, for accepting our invitation. So please, you can start whenever you want. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I would, of course, prefer to be in Portugal in person, but... Um, this is a bit difficult right now. Also, I was there for one month, uh, only two months ago. So I'm rather often in Portugal. Okay, so I understood that uh, the audience is a mixture of theory and experimentalists and also maybe some astrophysicists. So I will be try to explain as much as possible, but of course um, you can later ask questions, but also interrupt me if you want. So then let me start immediately. Okay, so here you have a brief overview. I want to give a short introduction into the subject and um, then talk about what we learned about the Higgs boson and what is important for us for our understanding. So I will talk about the role of the Higgs boson mass. And then I will move on directly to beyond standard model Higgs sectors because I, this is what I'm mostly working on and of course, we know also that there should be beyond standard model physics. I will talk about Higgs pair production and also the role as, of the Higgs boson as a portal to dark, dark matter. And if I have time, I will also touch on baryogenesis. So then let's start. Um, so here we have the four pillars of the standard model, which summarizes our today's understanding of particle physics. So we have the symmetries, the particle content, of course, and the fundamental forces. And finally, in 2012, with the discovery of the Higgs boson, the standard model was then also structurally completed so that we have now a full theory to describe fundamental physics. Still, as you all know, there are open questions that we cannot answer within the standard model. And here I list a few of them. Um, most prominent one maybe is the quest for dark matter. Also, of course, the question why there's more matter than antimatter in the asymmetry related to this, uh, the sources of CP violation. The neutrino mass in the standard model is not foreseen. We don't know why there are three generations in the standard model. The fundamental forces do not unify and we also cannot include in a mathematically consistent way gravity. So there are open questions. And in, answer to, in order to answer these questions, we need on the one hand, on the one side, of course, the experimental input but this has to be accompanied also from the theory side uh, to interpret what we see there. Okay, so what is the status? Uh, the, the Higgs boson has been discovered 10 years ago. Um, the, directly after its discovery, uh, the experiments have started to investigate it in detail and we have found out that it behaves very standard model-like. There have been a lot of tests of the standard model being done at the quantum level at highest precision to, and they have all shown the consistency of the standard model. However, as I said, we know that there must be new physics as there are these open questions, but sadly enough, so far there has been no direct discovery of, no phys of new physics. So what does that mean? This could mean that either new physics is heavy with new particles at, that appear at a large mass scale and we simply did not discover them yet because we do not have enough um, energy or new physics may be light, but it has small couplings. So in any case, whatever is realized, new physics is subtle. 
So we have to deal with small cross sections and also with novel signatures. And um, what we have, however, so the experimental reality is that we have not discovered new physics so far, but I think also as Guido Alterelli said when he was at KIT, also the situation is depressing. It's not desperate because we have something and what we have is the Higgs boson. And the question is now, what can we learn from Higgs physics about physics beyond the standard model? Okay, but let me still show you before I go into the details, uh, these very nice photos of the Higgs discovery more than 10 years ago, actually 10 years and a few weeks ago. This was really a big event. I mean, uh, the Higgs mechanism was predicted in 64 and it took us 48 years to discover it. And it took also a lot of money to discover it. Still, we always believed in it. And so after 48 years, uh, the discovery was announced. And you see here the photos of the people queuing up in front of the Audi Max because they of course knew that on that day something important would be announced. And here we see uh, the event with Fabiola Gianotti, who was then the speaker of Atlas, and Joe in Candela, who was the speaker of CMS. And we have here Rolf Heuer, who was then the general director, looking probably at the Higgs events. And now uh, Fabiola has become, in the meantime, also general director. And you see the Audimax was crowded. But of course, these two people, they had the right to enter, Francois Angler and Peter Higgs, since they were among those who predicted the Higgs mechanism. And we show also here, see that also physicists can have emotions, actually. I always said my son that this day was like Easter and Christmas together. And um, he, of course, the event was also broadcast. Here we have Daisy. It was also broadcast, of course, to KIT where I am located. On that day, I was a bit late to come to the event, so I drove a bit too fast. And as it uh, happened, uh, police stopped me. And I explained to them why I was so fast, but uh, they couldn't understand it. Maybe nowadays they could understand why I was so excited about it. So, and here you see um, 10 years after the Higgs discovery, there was a symposium at CERN, and at this occasion, I was invited to join. So I was very glad to be there and also felt very honored to be there. And it was in particular great to, to go to CERN after this long time of COVID. And this is also why I took this picture. So here you see, most of you will know it. These are the, the offices of the theory division. And I was so glad to be there that I had to take a photo of this. Anyways, let me come now to the subject of the talk. So let's start with the role of the Higgs boson mass. Now in the standard model, the Higgs boson is an input parameter. So we do not, uh, we cannot predict it. And this is also one of the reasons why of course we did not know how much center of mass energy we would need to produce the Higgs boson. And uh, we, the Higgs boson has been discovered, its mass has been measured. It's around 125 GV. And it uh, has been measured with uh, great precision. And of course, um, this precision will be increased in future still. And the question is, why do we need all this precision? Well, first of all, this allows us to do a self-consistency test of the standard model at the quantum level, because uh, we are doing quantum field theory. So we have to deal with quantum fluctuations and also the Higgs, of course, contributes to these quantum fluctuations. I will come back to this on the next slide. The precise knowledge of the Higgs boson mass is also important because it, the Higgs mass is related, of course, to the vacuum because the vacuum the, uh, is built up by the Higgs mass and the Higgs self-couplings. And uh, so the Higgs mass is related also to the stability of the electroweak vacuum. Actually, it turns out that uh, the standard model vacuum is meter stable. And uh, finally, all Higgs observables depend on the Higgs mass. So whatever is the uncertainty on the Higgs mass will be feedback in the uncertainty of the Higgs observables and thereby also in our interpretation of the Higgs observables. And finally, we want to know the Higgs boson mass also very precisely because it helps us to better understand beyond the standard model theories. Because it allows us to constrain the parameter space of these theories. 
it's clear that whatever beyond the standard model theory I look at, it has to contain a Higgs boson that behaves standard model-like because this is an experimental reality. And now if I then want within this new model have a Higgs boson of 125 GV, this has of course implications on the parameter values of the new model that are still allowed. And so in this way, by knowing the Higgs boson mass, we can test parameters and parameter relations of beyond standard model theories, although we have not directly discovered them yet. But let me come back to the self-consistency test because it's related to something very recent, namely to this announcement of, of CDF, of the measurement of the W boson mass. And we see here um, the measurement, uh, as we had it so far, here we have, uh, so we have here the plot the W moson mass versus the top mass. And here we have, uh, including the uncertainties, what we would expect in the standard model. And now with this new announcement of uh, CDF or Tevatron, lab two Tevat, uh, of, of CDF, we see that there's a tension. Yeah, this uh, is a tension of, um, seven sigma with respect to what we would expect in the standard model. Now, as I said, um, the Higgs mass and all other particles that we have in the theory, they contribute to the W boson mass indirectly through these quantum corrections. And in the standard model, we have this tension. However, if we include physics beyond the standard model, then we have new particles. And these new particles, they can of course also contribute to these quantum fluctuations of the electroweak precision parameters and so also, of course, to the W boson mass. And um, it can be that these new physics um, models can resolve this discrepancy. For example, supersymmetry could resolve this discrepancy. Okay, so this again shows you that it is important to very precisely know the Higgs boson mass. Now I have talked about supersymmetry by giving this example that it could possibly resolve this, um, this discrepancy. So let me give me a talk a little bit about supersymmetry. I know uh, a lot of people um, are not so interested in that anymore, but still I think it's a very interesting theory. I would even say it's one of the best studied and uh, most prominent extensions beyond the standard model. And why is it so interesting? I think from, from my personal point of view, I find supersymmetry a very interesting theory because it allows for the maximal possible symmetry that is still compatible with the Poincaré group. And so far, symmetries have always guided us the way in our understanding of particle physics. So why should not also supersymmetry maybe have um, its realization in nature. But of course, we will not know until we will not discover it. Another reason, of course, uh, to motivate supersymmetry is that it solves some of the open problems of the standard model. So supersymmetry can provide a dark matter candidate. It may be through superstrings uh, allow us to finally be able to include gravity. And also um, it, within supersymmetry, at least within the MSSM, um, the fundamental forces can be unified, which is not possible in the standard model. So there are good reasons to look for supersymmetry. But of course you have to pay a price for it. And the implications that you have is that you have an enlarged particle spectrum, namely each standard model particle has a supersymmetric. A partner particle, and you have to look and find these particles, and it has an enlarged Higgs sector. Actually, before the LHC was turned on, the uh, common belief was that uh, we would immediately see supersymmetry if it was realized, because the signatures are very spectacular. You have multi lepton, multi quark final states at a large missing transverse energy. This is something that you would have immediately seen. Unfortunately, nothing has been seen so far, and this could be now because supersymmetry is not realized or because these SUSI particles are too heavy to be produced. The interesting thing is that the Higgs boson mass with a mass of 125 GV still allows for supersymmetry. 
why do I emphasize this? The reason is that in SUSI theories, um, the Higgs boson mass can be calculated from the input parameters. In the standard model, it's an input parameter, but in SUSI, it can be calculated from the input parameters. Now, due to SUSI relations, you can derive an upper bound on this Higgs boson mass. And it turns out that it, the upper bound of this the Higgs boson that would represent the standard model-like Higgs boson is given by the Z boson mass. So of course you would say this would immediately exclude supersymmetry. However, I mentioned it already, you have to include quantum corrections. And when you calculate the quantum corrections to the Higgs boson mass, they can be quite important. Actually, the most dominant ones come from the top stop sector and they come with the M top quark mass to the power four. So you can have substantial corrections. And by including these quantum corrections, it's possible to shift the Higgs boson mass to the discovered 125 GB. Still, the corrections are very important and it's not so easy to, to get it there and you need to tune your parameters a bit. However, if you get to, to the next to minimal supersymmetric extension, so if you go a bit beyond the minimal version, then this tension becomes a bit less because at three level you have additional terms that contribute. In any case, it's interesting because if the discovered Higgs boson mass had been, for example, 300 GV, this would not have been possible within supersymmetry anymore. Yeah, if it would have been 300 GV, then we could say supersymmetry is not realized. But with 125 GV, everything is still possible. So, you see uh, these predictions of the Higgs boson masses within the um, SUSI theories are very important because as I said before already, they can teach us something about, about the parameter space. And I have mentioned here two versions of supersymmetry. Let me start by stating that in supersymmetry, actually you need uh, to extend your Higgs sector. In the standard model, we have only one Higgs doublet that leads to one physical Higgs particle. However, in supersymmetry, due to supersymmetry, if you want to fulfill this, you have to in introduce at least two complex Higgs doublets. And of course, this leads then to more Higgs bosons in your spectrum. And so you do not have only one Higgs spectrum, but in the minimal version, in the minimal extension, you would have five Higgs bosons. And if you want to be a bit more complex and go to the next to minimal version, you even have six, seven Higgs bosons. And they can be either lighter or heavier than the discovered Higgs boson. And of course, you can look for them. And as I said, we have to include higher order corrections in the prediction of the masses of the standard model like Higgs boson. And there's a whole industry going on in providing these higher order corrections. And we have made quite some progress here. And now we have calculations available at to two loop level and even up to three loop level. And of course, also there are a lot of programs on the market. So if you are interested in supersymmetry and if you want to calculate for your specific parameter setup, the Higgs boson mass, then you have a lot of programs among which you can choose to calculate this. And our, so our group is working on these corrections. And so we slowly make our way through. And recently we have provided, um, we have continued with our two loop corrections. And here you see the outcome. In this plot, you see our prediction for the Higgs boson mass that, for, for the mass of the Higgs boson that represents the standard model like Higgs boson as a function of a the parameter of this next minimal version that we look at. And here in red, you see our latest corrections. So in, in black, you see the one loop corrections. And here then in red, you see our newest, no, in, in blue, sorry. Uh, yeah, in red and in blue, you see our, uh, in red and in black, you see our previous corrections. And in red, you see our newest corrections. And you see the effect is small. This is because we are already at two loop level, but still in order to make precise predictions, we need these um, uh, corrections because they allow us then to constrain our model. Okay, so this was one example of how, even if you do not discover new physics directly at the moment, how you can use the knowledge that you have on the Higgs boson mass in order to constrain beyond the standard model 
physics. And let me now move on to beyond the standard model Higgs sectors in general. I already showed you one example of supersymmetry where you have an extended Higgs sector and I will discuss now more examples and also show you what you can learn from them. So I will look at extended Higgs sectors. Of course, you could first ask why I am, or why in general people are so interested in models with enlarged Higgs sectors. Well, of course, first of all, you could answer why not? I mean, also in the fermion gauge sector, we see that uh, the particle content is not minimal. So why should it be minimal in the Higgs sector? But there are of course also other reasons. And the reasons are that extended Higgs sectors, they could alleviate the metastability of the vacuum that we observe in the standard model. Also extended Higgs sectors, if you imply certain discrete symmetries on them, they can provide a dark matter candidate. Another interesting feature that extended Higgs sectors have is that they can provide additional sources of CP violation. And this is something we like because they can help, if you have CP violation, this can help you to explain why we have more matter than antimatter in, in the universe. Namely, you can explain this through a dynamical mechanism that we call baryogenesis. However, for baryogenesis to be at work, you need CP violation. And finally, many new physics models that solve problems of the standard model require an extended Higgs sector. And one such example we have already seen with supersymmetry. Now, there are a lot of models on the market. Yeah, you can, you have seen it probably in a lot of other talks. You can extend the Higgs sector by adding a doublet field, a triplet field, singlet field. So it's really a channel of new physics models. And the question is, how can we systematize our approach in order to be sure not to miss any new physics sign in view of all these models that we have on the market? And there are two approaches that are followed in this respect. One approach is the one that I've been talking about and that I will further talk about in this uh, talk. Namely, we can investigate specific models. And of course, we will start with these models that are well motivated and that solve our uh, most of the problems of the standard model that we have. On the other hand, you can follow a more model independent approach. And uh, in this, this approach is called effective theory. And what you do here is that you do not specify really what new physics is. You only say this new physics must be heavy. Yeah. And then you parameterize these new physics effects that enter at a high energy scale. A prominent example that you might know is given by the Fermi theory. So before the W boson was discovered, the beta decay was explained within the Fermi theory and uh, it was explained by an effective interaction between four fermions. And uh, this worked very well at low energies. However, with increasing energy, the predictions um, started to deviate. And the reason is that when you increase the energy and if there's new physics at that, at that time, new physics was the W boson, and so if you increase the energy and if you reach then the new physics scale, then of course you resolve this new physics. And this means that you really have to take into account this new degree of freedom. And so this means when you move from this effective Fermi theory to higher energy scales, then you start to see the new particle, which is the W boson mass, uh, the W boson, and then you approach the full theory. Still at low energies, you can work with this effective theory. And what it means is that when you describe um, new physics through effective theory operators, then you deal at lowest dimension with dimension six operators that are suppressed by this new physics scale. And so in this sense, you can parameterize your ignorance by these dimension six operators that are built up by the standard model field and um, the new physics scale, you parameterize it by this lambda. However, I mean, this is a very nice approach on the one hand, because it allows you to describe uh, a, a lot of new physics models uh, in a rather model independent way. But of course, it's also clear that such an approach does not allow you to parameterize new physics that is light. 
And I mentioned it already before, if you have extended Higgs sectors and several Higgs bosons, it can also be that these new Higgs bosons are lighter than the standard model Higgs boson. And the reason why you have not discovered them yet is simply because they couple too weakly to the standard model particles so that you haven't seen them yet. But it's clear in order to describe light new physics effects, you have to take a specific model because you can't describe it with effective theory. Okay, so as I said, I will talk about specific models. And here I have shown you just as an example, a few extended tick sectors, and you see already there are a lot of them. Yeah, They have all rather boring names. They are based on singlet extensions of the standard model Higgs sector, doublet extensions, or singlet and doublet extensions, and there are even many more on the market than those that I show here. And of course, the question is, how would you approach this? Yeah, how, I mean, in view of all these models, what should you do? And so you need some guideline for, the, for model selection. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. And um, some guidelines that I find useful are summarized here. Of course, I think that's natural. You would start always with the simplest model and then become more and more complex. Then, of course, one thing that is very important, whatever model you study, you have to make sure that it is compatible with all relevant experimental constraints and also with the theoretical constraints. I will come back to this point. Of course, the model that you look at solve, it should solve at least some of the flaws of the standard model. And finally, it should be testable in experiment because it makes no sense to study a model that cannot be tested. I always tell my students who may be very clever and invent very nice models, but if you can't test them in experiment, they just don't serve for anything. Okay, so I said that when we, um, look at new physics models, we have to make sure to fulfill the constraints. So we have on the one hand, the experimental constraints. One very stringent constraint is given by the electroweak rho parameter. In the standard model, this rho parameter, which is the ratio between neutral and charge currents, is predicted to be very close to one. And this has been measured to great accuracy, so you cannot ignore this constraint. However, it turns out when you calculate the rho parameter as a theorist in, in a general model with several Higgs bosons, then it turns out that when you have Higgs sectors that are extended by singlets or doublets, that they automatically fulfill this requirement that the rho parameter is close to one. So this is a very good motivation to study Higgs sector extensions by singlets and doublets. Then, the dangerous thing is when you have models where you have uh, Higgs doublets, at two Higgs doublets at least, then you can encounter flavor changing neutral currents. This means that uh, a neutral Higgs boson could couple to two quarks of a different family. And this would introduce, for example, KK bar mixing at, so K on K on bar mixing at three level, which has not been observed. So you have to avoid this flavor changing neutral currents. And in, as I said, if you have two doublets, you encounter them. And in order to avoid this, you have to apply additional symmetries on your Higgs sector that uh, ensure that all right-handed fermions of a given electric charge couple to exactly only one Higgs doublet. And then you can show that you do not encounter this dangerous flavor changing neutral currents. And this leads then to these four types of two Higgs doublet models that you have for sure already seen in many talks. Then of course, there are further constraints. We have these very price electric precision observable measurements that we have to respect. We have flavor constraints that we must not um, ignore. And of course, we have the Higgs boson itself. We might have to make sure that our extended Higgs sector contains at least very one Higgs boson that behaves very standard model-like. And uh, we have to take into account also that the direct searches for additional Higgs bosons have not discovered any Higgs bosons so far. So we have to take this into account when we look at the extended Higgs sector. Then some of these models predict also other new particles. For example, supersymmetry predicts additional particles beyond the standard model particles. We have to make sure that also here, 
we are not in conflict with the direct searches um, at present and earlier experiments. Then we have uh, contributions of the new physics uh, particles of our models uh, to low energy observables that have been measured. We, if we have models where we have a dark matter candidate, we should make sure that uh, the relict density that we can then calculate complies with the experimental value. At least it should not overshoot the relic density. If it's below the measured relic density, it's still okay because you could always say, well, there are other dark matter candidates. And finally, if you have models where you have CP violation, you should of course make sure that you do not violate the very stringent constraints that come from the electric dipole moments. So when you take all this together, this of course then constrains the parameter space of the model you are interested in. So these were the ex experimental constraints. But you have also theory constraints. Now, you, you all know the standard model Higgs potential, which has this typical minimax form. If you have now extended Higgs sectors with several degrees of freedom, then the Higgs potentials become much more complicated. And you should, of course, make sure that the Higgs potential is bounded from below. Then you should make sure that the global minimum of this potential of your new theory uh, has its is at the electroweak um, is at the value of 246 GV, and you should also ensure that you do not violate perturbative unitarity. And so, what we do is when we uh, look at a specific new physics model, we take this model, we uh, take the parameter that the parameters that define our model, and then we make a scan in the parameter space of this model. And we calculate all the observables that I was just discussing. Yeah, we would calculate then the Higgs observables, the B physics of our observables, dark matter relic density, and so on. And we would test if we are compatible with the constraints. And in this way, we then get a parameter sample that we can use to make prediction within the model that we are studying. And by this way, we can then give to the experiment to the experimentalist information that is still compatible with all the constraints that we have. And we can tell them, look, within this model, you should still be able to see this or that signature. And in this way, we can give guideline to the experiments. So let's have a closer look how this works in practice. So first of all, we see, uh, should, let me show here as an example, uh, what is the present status of the Higgs measurements. So we have here uh, the measurements of Atlas of the Higgs data, and uh, this is all normalized uh, to the standard model expectations. And you see all these experimental results are very close to one, which means that all the Higgs observables of the discovered Higgs boson behave very standard model-like, which is a bit sad for our beyond uh, physics, new physics models, because this really constrains them already very much. And how this looks in practice, I'll show you here. This is a very old paper, but still I think it's instructive. So what we did here in this work is we took several new physics extensions. They are all named here. Here we have the standard model extended by singlet field. Here we have a two Higgs doublet uh, model with CP violation. Here we have a two Higgs doublet model with an additional singlet. And we took these models. Here we have also a SUSI model. And we made what I just told you. We made a parameter scan. We checked for all constraints. And then we calculated observables. And the observables that I show you here is that um, we have in these models additional Higgs bosons. And we looked at the lighter of the additional Higgs boson. And what we did is we calculated its production cross section at the LHC and uh, multiplied it with its uh, decay in the tau final state. So what we did is we calculated the rate of this new Higgs boson in the tau final state for all the parameter points that fulfill the constraints. And they are what the outcome is shown here by the scattered points. And this black line is just um, to give you some um, guideline. What we plot here is what we would get in the standard model if the standard model Higgs boson had this mass. This is just to give a guideline um, of the size of the cross section. And now comes the interesting point. What you see here is, you see here a peak, yeah? There are a lot of uh, points still allowed that shoot up here. And uh, now you can ask, of course, why, why 
are they still allowed? And the reason is that at this point, yeah, in 2017, the experimentalist had not looked into um, data, they had not looked into uh, for light Higgs bosons. Yeah? Here you are below 125 GV, and there didn't exist uh, searches that were sensitive enough to exclude such a light Higgs boson. And it would have been very nice, of course, if um, finally they had discovered a light Higgs boson there. But in the meantime, we have data. Experiment has looked into this region, and these data are by now excluded. And of course, this constraints then further our models. And this shows you now a very nice example on how uh, experiment feeds back on the theory predictions. So this was an experimental constraint. Let me now also show you what we can learn from theory constraints about our models. And this is now something where we look at a two Higgs doublet model. And what we did here is we looked into two different versions of the, you know, it's, it's, yeah, we looked into two different versions of the two Higgs doublet model. One is called type one and one is called type two. These types, as I said, they arise because we have to impose certain symmetries to avoid flavor changing due to currents. And again, we did what we did is we made a scan in the parameter space of our model and we kept only the points that are still allowed. And what we then did is we looked on the behavior of the Higgs couplings as a function of the energy. And they change with the energy. And so what we said is, okay, assume our model is valid up to, let's say, to the Planck scale. Is our model then still per, uh, perturbative? Yeah, this is what we checked. And we found that um, for the two Higgs doublet type, model type one, the model is still perturbative for all these parameter points up to very high scales. However, if you turn to the two Higgs doublet model type two, which is much more constrained because of B physics observables, then you see the following. If you want your model to be valid up to the Planck scale, then only parameter values around this cosine beta minus alpha value equal to zero are allowed. So you are very much constrained to this parameter region in case the, this model is realized and in case this model is valid up to the Planck scale. Now, what does this parameter here mean? It means that actually the standard model like Higgs boson that you have in this theory is very close to the standard model. So here you see how a theory request drives you really into the standard model limit. Of course, it could be that the model simply is not realized up to the Planck scale. But if you think that it is, then you know already something about the parameter space of your model. So again, you can learn something about the model, even though you have not discovered it yet. Another interesting theory constraint is the vacuum stability. As I said, we have to make sure that the vacuum that is related to the extended Higgs sector is stable and is also physically makes sense, makes sense from a physics point of view. And this uh, here, I want to show you an example of the next to minimal two Higgs doublet model. So what we do here is we add a second Higgs doublet to our model and a singlet field. Now, when you investigate the potential of this very complex uh, Higgs sector, then you find that there are many different vacuum states possible. So you can have the situation and this you see, okay, we do the same play. What we do is we take our model, we make a scan in the parameter space and we keep uh, all points that are compatible with our experimental constraints. But uh, we didn't uh, look for the vacuum yet. And what we found is that we can have points where we have only one vacuum state and this vacuum state is exactly the vacuum that we are living in. This would be these gray points here. Then we could have the situation where we have several uh, minima. However, the minimum that is related to our electrovic vacuum is the lowest one, so it's absolutely stable. This would also still be okay for us, of course. We could have the situation where we could have several vacua, and the vacuum we are living in is, 
is maybe not the lowest line one, but it's long lived. So it's meta stable. And uh, as long as it's uh, long lived enough to exceed the lifetime of the universe, this would also be okay for us. So the gray, green, and blue points would still all be okay for us. However, now with red, it becomes dangerous because we could have a, a CP violating vacuum that we have not discovered. This, then we could have what is much more dangerous, a, a charge breaking vacuum, which uh, physically is not allowed. Or we could have even an electroweak vacuum, however, with a different vacuum expectation value. So not 246 GV. And of course, this would then not be for us a world that we could live in. And so this means that all these points here would not be allowed yeah, because they are simply not physical. So what does it mean for experiment? So what I, I have, I show you these points here in a plane, namely I show you these points in the plane of the photon rate of the standard model like Higgs boson against the charge Higgs mass. So suppose that, um, oh yeah, I mean, this means basically that if these points, which at that time, 2019, were still allowed, if they persist, then it would mean that, so if, for example, this point would, after all, not be excluded, then it would mean for us that this model is excluded. And so again, you can learn something about your model without even having discovered anything so far. Okay, so these were on, um, on what we can learn from the constraints. So another very interesting thing for us now is um, Higgs pair production. So why is Higgs pair production so interesting for us? It's interesting because it provides the ultimate test of the Higgs mechanism. Why is this so? So let me explain this to you. So here you see the Higgs potential of the standard model. I have rewritten it here. And what you can read off from the Higgs potential is first of all, the mass of the Higgs boson, then the trilinear and the quartic Higgs self-coupling. And you see in the standard model, the Higgs self interactions, they are given in terms of the Higgs boson mass. And now that we know the Higgs boson mass, we know also if the standard model is realized, what are the values of the Higgs self couplings. However, we haven't measured them yet. Suppose you can measure them, then you could take them the measured value and reconstruct the Higgs potential and then experimentally verify that it has indeed this typical minimax form that you need for the Higgs mechanism to be at work. So, and this is the reason why the measurement of the Higgs self interactions provide the ultimate test of the Higgs mechanism. Now, how can we measure these couplings? The trilinear Higgs self coupling is accessible with, via Higgs pair production. I will show the, the figures in the next slide. And the quartic Higgs self coupling would, in principle, be measurable in triple Higgs production, which, however, most probably will not be possible. So let's look at Higgs pair production. So at the LHC, the dominant production process for a standard model Higgs pair is given, like for single Higgs production, through gluon fusion. And the diagrams that you contribute here are loop induced. Uh, the reason is that the Higgs boson only couples directly to massive particles and the gluons are massless. So the Higgs boson has to couple to the gluons via a top loop, via top loop because the Higgs top loop cover coupling is the largest one. So what you see is you have two diagrams that contribute to this process. You have the destroying diagram, which involves the Higgs self coupling that you are interested in. And you have a box diagram, which does not involve this coupling. So when you measure Higgs pair production, you have to extract from this whole process then the trilinear Higgs self coupling. Now, unfortunately, this cross section is rather small. First of all, it's small because you produce two heavy particles in the final state. Second, however, it's small because there's a destructive interference between these two diagrams. And you can see this in this plot here. What we show here is uh, you need not look at these processes, but let's look only at gluon fusion into a Higgs pair. So we plot here the cross section for a center of mass energy of 14 TV as a function of a variation of the trilinear Higgs self coupling away from the standard model value. And you see at one, you are in the standard model and here you are so not in the minimum, however, you are rather small. And if the Higgs coupling would 
deviate from the standard model, then you would move away from this destruct destructive interference and become larger if it gets more negative. So there's a destructive interference in the standard model. Now, since, of course, it, we have, I mean, since it's a small cross section from the theory side, we have to make very precise predictions yeah, to guide the experiment. And also since it's gluon fusion induced, it's a QCD process. We know that already from single Higgs production, we know that higher order corrections, higher order QCD corrections will be very important. And therefore a lot of people have made a lot of effort to also include higher order corrections to Higgs pair production. And um, the, our group has participated here as well. So we have, uh, on the one hand, Gudrun Heinrich's group, who is also at KIT, and our group, who did a calculation of the next leading order QCD corrections to into Higgs pairs with full top quark mass dependence. Because uh, in the heavy top limit, this cross section was already calculated at next leading order QCD. But of course, you have to know if this is a good approximation or not. And this you can only know if you do the full calculation. We did it, and Gudrun's group did it also. They, they finished before us. So what we found uh, both groups consistently is that the inclusive cross-section, the mass effects are of the order of minus 15% on top of the leading order ones. And if you look at the distributions, which are interesting for the experiments, then the top quark mass effects are even much more important. You can see they can be up to 40%. And in the meantime, there has been much more progress. We have even part of the three loop corrections available now for this process. And of course, for, for the experiment, it's also important to know how well, um, uh, how much they can trust these numbers. So we need to uh, give an uncertainty estimate. And our group has provided such an uncertainty estimate, which comes from the, uh, from the fact that we do not have all orders of higher order corrections. And um, the uncertainty is of the order of 20% actually. Now, as I said, uh, the cross section is rather small. If you include all higher order corrections, it's 30 femtobahn, and you have to compare this to single Higgs production where you are at uh, 44 picobahn. So you are factored 1000 higher. So this means that to measure this cross section is a real ex uh, experimental challenge. And um, still, the experiments do that, of course. It's a very important process, and they have already made a, a remarkable pro progress. And at present, the limits are such that the trilinear Higgs self coupling is, in the meantime, constrained by both experiments to values between about minus one and uh, six, or minus two and nine. So. Now, uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I will not read everything, but let me still discuss a little bit these new physics effects in Higgs pair production. Because they are very interesting. If you go beyond the standard model, then this Higgs cross section for Higgs pair production can become larger. And there are a lot of effects that you can have from new physics on Higgs pair production. And as an example, I show you here the Feynman diagrams of a supersymmetric extension. But this applies also to many other extended Higgs models. And namely, what you have in extended Higgs models is that you can have additional Higgs bosons. And these additional Higgs bosons can be heavier than the standard model like Higgs boson. And if they are twice the standard model like Higgs mass, this means the heavy Higgs boson can be produced on shell and decay into a Higgs pair, into a standard model like Higgs pair. And this means that Higgs pair production is resonantly enhanced. So this is one important effect that can increase the cross section. Then of course, the trilinear Higgs self coupling would differ from the standard model. And also the coupling of this six boson to the top quarks could differ from the standard model and have effects. And finally, in SUSY theories, you could also have um, other particles that run around in the loop. So what we did is we looked at to, into a, some archetypical beyond standard model Higgs sectors. We took into account all experimental and theoretical constraints. We made a big scan in the parameter space of these models, kept only the points that are allowed. And then we calculated the Higgs pair production cross sections to see if there are still interesting effects that can happen and that are still compatible with all measurements. 
So let me skip all these details here and show you directly the results because I think there are a lot of experimentalists and for them this would be the most interesting one. So, okay, as I said, we took into account all constraints, also the Dykes constraints that we have. We included also higher order corrections. Um, and let me skip this. I come back to this. Let me directly show what we got. So what we got is that in the models that we investigated, we can still have Higgs pair production cross sections that can, for example, in the two Higgs doublet model, go up to 440 femtobarn. And you have to compare this to 38 femtobarn in the standard model. So these new physics effects can enhance the cross sections. And this is all still compatible with the standard model. And interesting enough, also, the, the trilinear Higgs self coupling, also very constrained, can still be zero. Yeah, this is not excluded also. So you can still have in this Higgs pair production sector effects that are really non-standard model-like. And let me show you here how this looks like. So for example, here what I show you for is for the two Higgs doublet model, I show you all the parameter points of our model that are still allowed. And I show here the Higgs pair production cross-section as a function of the intermediate resonantly produced Higgs boson mass. Now uh, you see here about here would be the standard model cross section. And you see, you can still have a lot of points that are largely enhanced compared to the standard model. And what I show here by this color code is the total width of this resonantly produced particle. I show it here because the experiments, when they look for resonant Higgs pair production, they apply the narrow width approximation. And of course, you have to know if this is still a good approximation. And as you can see, this for this two HDM parameter points, it's perfectly okay to do this narrow width approximation. So if you are interested in this, you can have a look into our paper. We discuss it there for all the models that we have looked at. You can find all the cross sections and you can also find interesting benchmark points that you might want to investigate. Okay, I don't know, I started, uh, how much time do I still have to It's not that for minutes. Well, how much was it? Five. Okay, good. So then um, let me briefly discuss uh, also some other as aspects. So dark matter is something that we are very much interested in, of course. And also here, we can learn something from the Higgs sector because the, we can have dark matter that emerges from the Higgs sector. For example, I show you here, uh, the standard model extended by a singlet field. And uh, we have then also an extended Higgs sector. And if we impose certain symmetries, we can arrive at a model where one of the Higgs particles, which I call A here, it's a pseudoscalar, is stable and becomes the dark matter candidate. And since we impose the symmetries, this um, particle cannot couple to any standard model particle, but it can couple to the Higgs boson. And in this sense, the Higgs boson is then a portal to dark matter. And of course, you can use then the Higgs boson to look if you can find the dark matter particle at the LHC. How can you do that? You could, for example, look for invisible Higgs decays because uh, the Higgs boson couples to the dark matter particles, which I call A here. It decays into them, and these would then not further decay into standard model particles because it's not allowed, and you would have a Higgs to invisible decay. And uh, of course, the experiments are looking for such Higgs to invisible decays, and they have constrained the branching ratio in the meantime to around 0.11. And in order to compare this with our model, we again have to make predictions for such decays within our models and we have to make precise predictions. So what we did is we calculated higher order corrections to these decays. And what I show you here is the branching ratio of such an invisible decay within our model uh, at next to leading order as a function of the leading order decay and uh, all these red and blue points here are points allowed uh, by the constraints. 
and the dotted line is the limit on the that we have from the experiment on the invisible branching ratio. And what you can see is um, that you can have points where the decay would be allowed at leading order, but excluded when you in, in, include the next to leading order corrections or vice versa. And this would once again give you a constraint on your parameter space if you look here. However, if you see here this red region, this is uh, the, the uncertainty that we have on the measurement. So for the time being, our next to leading other corrections uh, do not do any harm, so to say, because they are well within the experimental error. But of course, with increasing precision, it will become important to have precise predictions. And finally, as I said, the Higgs sector can teach us something about electroweak barrier genesis or we can turn it around. If electroweak barrier genesis is the dynamical mechanism that explains why there is more matter than antimatter in the, in the universe, then this con can constrain our Higgs sector. Now, how does it work? I mean, as I said, we have obviously an, an imbalance between matter and antimatter. Otherwise, our universe would only be dominated by radiation. And we have to explain that. And the dynamical mechanism that can explain this is given by electric barrier genesis, and it's related to the Higgs sector. And it can be at work if the three Sakharov conditions are fulfilled. So what you need is um, viral number violation, you need C and CP violation, and you need departure from the thermal electroweak, uh, from the thermal equilibrium. And um, how this works is basically shown here. So in the early universe, the vacuum expectation value is of the Higgs is zero. The, all particles are massless. And when the temperature of the universe uh, falls, then bubbles with a non-zero wave, they start to nucleate within this uh, thermal bath where the wave is zero, and they expand. Now, the massless particles in this plasma with the zero wave, they, um, they interact they interact with the bubble wall of these uh, bubbles with the true vacuum. And here, because of baryon number violation, you create an imbalance that is then converted into a baryon asymmetry. And in this way, you create a baryon asymmetry. And when now the bubbles expand, this baryon asymmetry is swamped into this region where we live, yeah, where is the true vacuum. However, since we are doing thermodynamics, you can say, of course, well, if one process exists, also the backwards process is, exists. And so the baryon asymmetry that was created through these processes would be washed out. In order to avoid this washout, what you need is an electroweak phase transition that is of strong first order. And here comes the Higgs now into game. You have to compute the Higgs potential as a function of the temperature. And you have to investigate of if the phase transition is of strong first order. How can we imagine that? So what you see here is the Higgs potential in the very early universe where the WEF is zero. And now the universe cools down and you see how the Higgs potential evolves as a function of the temperature. Now you see with cooling down, there's a second minimum that is formed and you further cool down. And at some moment, the second non-zero wave and the minimum with the zero wave, they are degenerate. And then the, uh, the temperature cools down further. And finally, the vacuum with the true wave is, the, has, is deeper and we, we go into this vacuum we are living in. And now if this phase transition where you go from a zero wave to a non-zero wave is of strong first order, then you have at least the condition that allows you to have electric barrier genesis at work. And then you can calculate if indeed the amount of matter antimatter asymmetry is the one that you measure, but you need CP violation. And this is why we are so much interested in CP violation and why we need extended tick sectors because in the standard model, we have CP violation, we have the CKM matrix, but the CP violation is too small. And okay, so to finish this, let me just mention, we investigated electroweak barrier genesis for a lot of models and we found that some of these models are indeed capable of having a strong first order phase transition and 
the next steps that we want to take now is to calculate for these models the value of the baryon asymmetry and to investigate if it reproduces the value that has been measured. And uh, if we find that it can do that, then our model is allowed. If we find that it cannot do that, then the model is excluded. So I skipped all the rest. Let me come to my conclusions. First of all, I think we all agree the flaws of the standard model, they call for new physics. Unfortunately, so far we have no direct sign of new physics, but we have the Higgs boson. It cannot give the, us the answer to the life, the universe and everything. However, we can learn a lot from it. And I have shown you quite some examples where, um, now I've gone too far. I've shown you some examples that uh, show you how, what you can learn from what we have already. So we can get insights in the allowed ranges of our BSM models. We can get insights in the uh, mechanism of mass generation in the structure and in the dynamics of electric symmetry breaking in the nature of dark matter and in biogenesis. And I didn't discuss it here, but we can also get insights in flavor and CP puzzle. So I think for sure we will have a lot of interesting times ahead. And with this, I finish. Thank you for your attention.